You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is Lecture 3 of Practical Advice to Teachers by Rudolf Steiner. Lecture 3 is given on August 23, 1919. Yesterday I pointed out that our teaching should begin with a formative artistic quality, so that the whole being of the children, especially the will, can be stimulated by the lessons. Our discussion here will help you understand how important such procedures are, and they will help you understand that we must always be aware of the fact that there is something dead in the human being, something dying that must be transformed and brought to new life. <clears throat> when we approach beings of nature and the world as a whole, merely as passive viewers, with an understanding that works only in mental representations, we exist more within a dying process. But when we approach beings of nature and the world through the will, we exist within an enlivening process. As educators, therefore, our task is to constantly enliven what is dead and prevent what approaches death from dying entirely in the human being. Indeed, we must fructify that dying with the enlivening element developed through the will. Consequently, when the children are young, we should not be afraid to introduce an artistic form into our lessons from the very beginning. <clears throat> Everything artistic that approaches humankind divides into two streams, the stream of sculpture and images, and the stream of music and poetry. These two artistic streams are really polar opposites, but there is also a real capacity for synthesis to higher unity precisely because of this polarity. You surely realize that this duality in the artistic realm finds expression even in the world's evolution of the races. You need only recall certain writings of Heinrich Heine, Footnote, Heinrich Heine, 1797 to 1856, German lyric poet, satirist, and publicist, lived in Paris until 1831. Owing to an incurable spinal disease, he was confined to bed in 1848. His verse transcended Romanticism and began to express a more modern temperament, containing political and social criticism notable for its sardonic wit and arrogant radicalism. His volumes of verse contain some of the best-loved German lyrics, many set to music by Schumann and Schubert. End of footnote. <clears throat> this will direct your attention toward a certain duality, everything that has arisen from the being of the Greeks in the way most suited to them, in the most exalted sense, has a tendency toward sculpture and images, and all that emanates from the Jewish people tends toward music. Consequently, we find these two streams divided, even racially, and those who are open to such observations will not find it difficult to follow this thinking in the history of art. Of course, there are always efforts, justifiably so, to unite the musical with the sculptural and pictorial. However, the only way they can be completely united is in eurythmy, once it has been fully developed, so that the musical and the visible become one. I am not referring, of course, to the beginnings of eurythmy as we are working with it now, but to what must eventually exist in eurythmy. We must then consider the fact that within the totality of harmonious human nature there is a sculptural, pictorial element toward which the human will tends. What is the proper characterization of this human tendency to become sculptural and pictorial? <clears throat> if we were beings of understanding only, if we were able to observe the world through our mental representations, we would eventually become walking dead. We would present the image of dying beings on earth. We save ourselves from this mortality only by feeling in ourselves the urge to enliven what is dying in concepts through sculptural and pictorial imagination. If we wish to be true educators, <coughs> excuse me, if you wish to be true educators, you must be on your guard against making everything abstractly uniform. Do not allow yourselves to say that we should not develop the death process in the human being, that we should avoid training the conceptual realm of ideas in the children. This mistake in the realm of the soul and spirit is like that of a doctor who observes cultural evolution and then announces, as though he is a great teacher, that bones are a dying part of human beings. 
Therefore, he says, let us guard people against this dying element by keeping the bones soft and lively. If physicians acted on such an opinion, it would lead to a world of rickety people unable to fulfill their tasks. It is always incorrect to speak as many theosophists and anthroposophists do about Araman and Lucifer and their influence on human evolution, saying that they harm human nature and must be guarded against. This would eventually exclude human beings from everything that should constitute humanity. We should not avoid educating the conceptual thinking element. We must educate it. But we must also never fail at other times to approach the nature of the child through the elements of sculpture and image. Unity arises out of this. Unity does not arise by extinguishing one element, but by developing both sides. People today cannot yet think in this way about unity. This is why they find it so difficult to understand the threefold arrangement of society. Footnote C. Rudolf Steiner, Social Issues, Meditative Thinking and the Threefold Social Order, and Toward Social Renewal, Basic Issues of the Social Question. End of footnote. It is entirely appropriate in society that the spiritual, economic, and legal spheres exist side by side. This is how unity comes about instead of being constructed abstractly. Imagine what it would mean for people to say that because the head is a unity, as is the rest of the body, the human being should not really exist at all. Excuse me, <clears throat> the human being should not really exist as such, that the head should be formed separately from the rest of the human being and be allowed to move about on its own in the world. We follow the creativity of nature only by allowing the whole to arise from all the independent parts. It is a matter of developing on the one side mental conceptual education and on the other the element of sculpture and image, which enlivens what is developed in the conceptual. We live in an age that always attempts to destroy consciousness, so that we are concerned with raising these things into our awareness without losing our innocence. We need not lose it if we avoid becoming abstract and establish things in a concrete way. It would be very good in every way if we could, for example, begin at the earliest possible point with the sculptural and pictorial element, letting children live in the world of color. Likewise, it would be, would be beneficial if we as teachers would steep ourselves in what Goethe presents in the instructive part of his theory of color. Footnote, a theory of color, MIT Press, Cambridge, Massachusetts, 1970, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, 1749-1832, during the late 1800s, Rudolf Steiner was an editor of the Goethe Archives in Weimar. His introductions to Goethe's works are collected in Nature's Open Secret, Introductions to Goethe's Scientific Writings. End of footnote. It is based on the way he always permeates every color with a nuance of feeling. Consequently, he emphasizes the challenging nature of red. He stresses not only what the eye sees, but also what the soul feels in red. Similarly, he emphasizes how the soul feels the stillness and absorption of blue. It is possible, without piercing children's innocence, to lead them into the realm of color so that the feeling nuances of the world of color emerge in a living way. Although at first the result is a great mess, it provides a good opportunity to train the children to be less messy. We should introduce children to color as early as possible and it is helpful to let them use colored paints on both colored and white surfaces. We should also endeavor to awaken in children the feelings that can arise only from a spiritual scientific perspective of the world of color. Footnote. See Steiner's lectures in Color. End of footnote. Working as I did with friends in the small, small dome of the Goetheanum can provide a living relationship to color. Footnote. See Rudolf Steiner's lecture, The Building at Dornach, in Art as Spiritual Activity, Rudolf Steiner's Contribution to the Visual Arts, Michael Howard, Editor. Also Steiner's Architecture as a Synthesis of the Arts, parenthesis includes Ways to a New Style of Architecture, end of parenthesis, end of footnote. <clears throat> One discovers when using blue, for example, that within blue itself there is a characterization of the whole realm of inner absorption. So if we want to paint an angel moved by inner absorption, we instantly have an urge to use blue, since the nuances of blue, the light and dark of blue, evoke in the soul 
a feeling of movement arising from the soul element. A bright orange evokes in the soul a sensation of shining and outer revelation. Therefore, if we want an effect that is aggressive or an exhortation, if the angel wants to speak to us, wants to emerge from the background and speak, then we express this with bright orange nuances. It is perfectly possible, in an elementary way, to show children this inherent liveliness of colors. Next we must become very certain in ourselves that plain drawing has something false about it. The truest of all is the feeling that comes from color itself. Somewhat untrue is the feeling that comes from shades of light and dark. And the least true is drawing. Drawing as such, in fact, approaches the abstract element in nature as something that is dying. Indeed, we should always draw in such a way <clears throat> that we become aware of drawing essentially what is dead. When we paint with colors, we should do it in such a way that it makes us aware that we are invoking the living out of what is dead. After all, what is the line of an horizon? If we simply take a pencil and draw an horizon, it is an abstract, deathly untruth against nature that always has two streams, the living, excuse me, the dead and the living. We merely cut off one of the streams and say that this is nature. If, on the other hand, I say that I can see something green and something blue that are adjacent but separate, then the line of the horizon appears where the two colors meet, and then I am saying, so, saying something that is true. In this way you gradually come to appreciate that the forms of nature really arise from the colors, and that drawing is therefore a process of abstraction. We should create in growing children a good mental picture and feeling for such things because this quickens the whole soul, creating for it a proper relationship with the outer world. Our culture has become sick because we lack a proper relationship with the external world. In teaching this way, we do not need to become one-sided. It would, for example, be valuable gradually to develop the possibility of moving from purely abstract artistic work, such as a person creates out of delight in beauty, to a concrete art or artistic craft. People today urgently need crafts that are truly artistic and can find a place in our broader culture. During the 19th century we reached the point where furniture was made merely to appear pleasing. For example, a chair was made to delight the eye, whereas a chair's inherent character should be felt when we sit on it, and this should determine the chair's form. It should not m merely be beautiful. It should invite us to feel our way into it and should have an inherent character that makes it suitable for sitting. The way the arms are attached to a chair and so on should express an integration with even a cultivated sense of touch. A person wants to be supported by the chair. We would do modern culture a great service by introducing artistic craft classes into education. Those of us who want the best for humankind become tremendously anxious about our culture today when we see, for example, the way abstractions and the primitive ideas of those with socialistic tendencies threaten to flood our culture which will not happen if we attain our goals. We would no longer find beauty in our civilization, but only what it has utility. Even when people dream of beauty, there is no feeling of the urgent need to stress the necessity of beauty as we drift toward socialism. This must be recognized. <clears throat> we should not be sparing with the sculptural and imagistic aspect in our classes. Likewise, we should not spare any effort in creating real feeling for the dynamic element expressed in architecture. It will be very easy to erroneously approach the children with certain aspects too early. But in fact, in some ways, it's all right when this happens. I was asked to say a few words to eighty children from Munich. They have been spending their holidays in Dornach, where Ms. Kisseleff gave them twelve Eurythmy lessons. Footnote, Tatiana Kisseleff. 1881 to 1970, Eurythmy teacher at the Gertianum from 1914 to 1927, then performance Eurythmist at the Gertianum. End of footnote. They demonstrated what they had learned to some of their children, excuse me, to some of their, had learned to some of their teachers and anthroposophists from Dornach. The children were very sharp, and after the performance, which included presentations by our Dornach Eurythmist, they crowded round and asked whether I liked their performance. They really wanted to perform well. The whole occasion was very heartwarming. 
The people who arranged the event had asked me to say a few words to the children on the evening before they returned to Munich. I said, quote, What I am going to say you will not understand now, but you will understand it later. Be alert in the future when you hear the word soul, since you cannot understand it yet. Unquote. It is extremely important to point out things in this way, things that children do not understand yet. One of today's primary principles effectively says that one should teach children only what they can understand. This is wrong. Such a principle deadens all education. Education comes to life only when children can take in what they are given, carry it for a while in their depths, and then bring it back to the surface later. This is most important for educating children between 6 and 14 years of age. Much can be allowed to trickle into their souls that will not be understood until later. Please do not have the feeling that you are wrong to overreach children's maturity by mentioning what they will understand only later on. The opposite principle has brought a somewhat deadening quality into our school systems. Children, however, must be made aware that they will have to wait. You can awaken them to the feeling that they must wait until they have the capacity to understand what they are absorbing. In this sense, it was not necessarily bad when in the past children were made to learn by rote, 1 by 1 equals 2, 2 by 2 equals 4, 3 by 3 equals 9, and so on, instead of learning as they do today with the help of a calculator. We need to break through this principle of holding back the child's understanding. This should, of course, be done with the necessary tact, since we must not distance ourselves from what children can love. Yet they can be permeated merely through the authority of the teacher, with much that they will be unable to understand until later. <clears throat> when you bring the elements of sculpture and image to children in this way, you will find that you can enliven much of what otherwise has a deadening effect. The musical element, which is inherently an element of the will that carries life, lives in us from birth, and as I said earlier, is expressed especially during the third and fourth years as an inclination to dance. Although this may sound odd, in the way this element expresses itself in the child initially, it carries life too strongly. It is too much of a shock and easily numbs awareness. This strong musical element very easily brings about a certain dazed state in the child's development. We have to say that the educational influence we exert through the musical element must consist in creating a harmony of the Apollonian element with the Dionysian element welling up out of the human being's nature. In the same way that the deadening influence must be enlivened by the sculptural, pictorial element, something that is intensely alive in the musical element has to be damped down so that it does not affect the human being too strongly. This is the feeling with which we ought to teach music to children. We must recognize that through the workings of karma, a person's nature develops with a bias toward one side or another. This bias is particularly noticeable in connection with the musical element, but I would point out that it is overly emphasized. We should not lay too much stress on the notion that one child is musical and another is not. Differences do exist, but to take them to their ultimate conclusion, to exclude the unmusical child from everything musical and give musical education only to children with musical inclinations is most definitely wrong. Even the most unmusical children must at least be present for any performance of music. It is right, of course, that as far as musical performances are concerned, increasingly only those children who are really musical will participate. But the unmusical children should always be present, and their receptivity to music should be developed. You will notice that even the most unmusical child has a trace of musical talent that is merely deeply buried and can be brought to light only by a loving approach. This should never be neglected, for it is far truer than we imagine that in Shakespeare's words, quote, The man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. Let no such man be trusted. Unquote. Footnote, this is from The Merchant of Venice, uh, Act 5, Scene 1, in full. The man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with the concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. The motions of his spirit are dull as night, and affections dark as Erebus. Let no such man be trusted. End of footnote. This is a fundamental truth, and for this reason no effort should be spared in bringing the musical element even to those children who are considered at first to be unmusical. 
It is of the greatest importance, particularly with respect to the social life, to foster music in an elementary way by teaching the children directly out of the musical facts without recourse to confusing and abstract theories. The children should gain a clear idea of elementary music, of harmonies, melodies, and so on, through the study of basic facts, through analyzing melodies and harmonies by ear. In this way we build up the whole artistic realm of music in the same simple fashion as we do the sculptural pictorial realm, where we similarly begin with the details. This method will help mitigate the amateurishness that plays such a major role in music. It cannot be denied that musical dilettantism serves a certain purpose in the social life of the community. Without it we would not progress particularly well. But it should be confined to the listeners. If this aim were to be achieved, it would be possible for those who perform and compose music to gain proper recognition within our social order. We should not forget that everything in the sculptural, pictorial realm works toward nurturing the distinct, unique nature of the human being while all that is musical and poetical fosters our social life. Human beings are brought together as one through music and poetry. They become individuals through sculpture and painting. The sculptural pictorial element supports the individuality, and people's living and intermingling in community through music and poetry sustain society. Poetry is conceived exclusively out of the solitude of the soul, and it is comprehended through the community of humankind. It is entirely accurate, not at all abstract, to assert that a person reveals their inner being through poetry and that in taking in the created work another individual meets it with their own deepest inner being. For this reason a delight in music and poetry and also a yearning for them should be encouraged in a growing child. A child should come to know what is truly poetical early in life. Today we grow up into a social order in which we are tyrannized by the prose element of speech. Countless reciters intimidate people by emphasizing the prose element in poetry, in other words, merely the actual meaning. When a poem is presented in a manner that gives pride of place to the nuances of content, it is regarded as faultless recitation. Truly perfect recitation, however, stresses the musical element. In the introductions I sometimes give to Eurythmic performances, I have pointed out how, with a poet such as Schiller, a poem emerges from the depths of the soul. Footnote. See chapter 3 in An Introduction to Eurythmy. Johann Christoph Friedrich von Schiller, 1759-1805, to German poet, playwright, as well as a surgeon while in the military. After his arrest by the Duke of Württemberg, he was allowed to publish only medical works. His, quote, An die Freunde, unquote, was used by Beethoven in his Ninth Symphony. His friendship with Johann Wolfgang von Goethe and Friedrich Hölderlin helped to inspire Schiller as a poet. End of footnote. (coughs) With many of his poems, an undefined melody first predominated in his soul, and he only later immersed the content, or the actual words, into the undefined melody. The content is suspended in the general melody, and the creative poetic activity comes into play in forming the language, not the content, forming the beat, the rhythm, the rhyme, the musical element on which poetry is based. I said that people are coerced by the modern method of recitation, because it is always an act of coercion to place the main emphasis on the prose, the content of a poem considered quite abstractly. In spiritual science we overcome this tendency, only by depicting a subject from the most varied viewpoints, as I always try to do. In this way our concepts remain artistically fluid. It gave me particular pleasure to be told one day by one of our artistically gifted friends that some of the lecture cycles I have given could be transcribed into symphonies purely on the basis of their inner structure. Some of the courses indeed evoke a musical quality in their form. Consider, for example, the course given in Vienna on life between death and a new birth. Footnote April 6th to the 14th, 1914, entitled The Inner Nature of Man and Our Life Between Death and Rebirth. End of footnote. You will see that you could make a symphony of it. This is possible because a lecture concerning spiritual science should not intimidate, but should instead arouse people's will. Yet when people encounter an idea like the threefold social order, they say that it is incomprehensible. It is not incomprehensible. It is only that they are unaccustomed to the manner of its presentation. 
This is why it is exceedingly important to draw the child's attention to the musical element on which every poem is founded. <clears throat> the lessons in a school should be arranged in a way that allows recitation to be closely connected to the musical element. The, musical, the music teacher should be in close contact with the teacher of recitation so that instruction in one subject follows directly on instruction in the other and so that a living relationship between the two is established. It would be particularly useful if the music and recitation teachers could work together in the classroom so that each could point out the links between the two subjects. This would be one way to eliminate a truly dreadful teaching method that is still very much prevalent in our schools, the abstract explanation of poems. This abstract explanation of poetry, verging almost on grammatical dissection, spells the death of everything that ought to work on the child. Interpretation of poems is quite appalling. You will protest that interpretation is necessary if the children are to understand the poem. I would counter that all the lessons must be structured to form a totality. This has to be discussed in the weekly meetings of the teachers. If a poem is to be recited, then the other lessons must encompass whatever might be necessary to shed light on the poem. The teachers must properly prepare the children to bring to the recitation lesson whatever they need to help them understand the poem. If, for instance, the children are to recite Schiller's Der Spatzer, Spaziergang, the cultural, historical, and psychological aspects of the poem can quite easily be presented to the children, not by going through the poem line by line, but simply by telling them whatever they need to know about the content. The recitation lesson itself must focus on the artistic presentation. <clears throat> if we were to bring the two streams of art together in this way, to harmonize human nature through and through, we should indeed achieve a great deal. Consider only that an infinitely important advance in human beings' harmony with the world is achieved when they sing. Singing is a way of reproducing what is already present in the world. When human beings sing, they express the momentous wisdom out of which the world is built. Likewise, we must not forget that in singing, the cosmic element of the actual sequence of notes is linked with human speech. This brings an unnatural element into singing. We can perceive it even in the incompatibility of the sound of a poem with its content. It would be a step in the right direction if we could further develop our considerations of poetry by reciting each line and enlivening only the rhyming word with melody so that the line flows along in, recita in recitation and the rhyming word is sung like an aria. This would ensure a clear distinction between the intonation of a poem and the words which actually disturb the musical part of human beings. When the musical ear of human beings is cultivated, they are inspired to experience in a living way the musical essence of the world itself. This is of the utmost value for the developing individual. We must not forget that in the sculptural pictorial realm we look at beauty, we experience it in a living way, whereas in the musical realm we ourselves become beauty. This is extraordinarily significant. The further you look back to ancient times, the less you find anything that we call musical. We have the distinct impression that music is still evolving, even though some musical forms are already dying out. This is rooted in a most significant cosmic fact. In all sculptural and pictorial art, the human being is the imitator of the old celestial order. The highest form of imitation of the cosmic celestial order is the representation of the world in sculpture or painting. <clears throat> in music, on the other hand, the human being is the creator. The human being does not recreate something that already, already exists, but lays the firm foundation for what is to arise in the future. Of course, simply imitating in music the sighing of the waves or the singing of the nightingale can produce a certain musicality. But all true music and poetry are new creations, and it is out of this act of creating anew that the Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan evolutions of the world will arise. Through music, we rescue in some way what still has to transpire. We rescue it out of the present nullity of its existence and give it life. Not until we link ourselves in this way to the great facts of the universe do we gain a genuine understanding of the nature of teaching. Only on the basis of such an understanding can the appropriate attitude of solemnity emerge so that teaching really becomes a kind of service to God, a consecrated act, 
What I present to you will become more or less an ideal, but surely what we put into practice can embrace the ideal. For instance, when we take our students into the mountains or the fields, out into nature, which we shall certainly do, we must not neglect a certain fact. We must always remember that lessons on natural science have their proper place only inside the classroom, as opposed to outside in nature. Let us assume that we step with the children out into nature, where we draw their attention to a stone or a flower. In doing so, we should strictly avoid any allusion to what we teach inside the classroom. In natural surroundings, we should draw the children's attention to nature in a way that is totally different from the method we use in the classroom. We should never forget to point out to them that we take them out into the open air so that they can experience the beauty of nature, and we bring the products of nature into the classroom so that we can dissect and analyze nature. We should never speak to the children out of doors about what we show them indoors, for instance plants. We should emphasize how different different it is to dissect dead nature in the classroom and to look upon the beauty of nature outdoors. We should compare these two experiences. It is not appropriate to take the children outside into nature in order to use natural object, objects to exemplify what we have taught them in the classroom. We should seek to arouse in children a different kind of feeling, the feeling that it is unfortunate that we have to dissect nature when we bring it into the classroom. But the children should, nevertheless, understand this as a necessity, for the destruction of what is natural is necessary in the building up of the human being. We should certainly not imagine that we are doing any good by giving a scientific explanation of a beetle out of doors in natural surroundings. The scientific description of the beetle belongs in the classroom. When we take the children out into the open, we have to arouse in them delight at the sight of the beetle, delight in the way he runs about and in his drollness, delight in his relationship to the rest of nature. Furthermore, we should not neglect to call forth in the child's soul a clear sense of how a creative element lives in music, transcending nature, and of how the human being shares in the creation of nature in creating music. This feeling will take shape only very primitively, of course, but it will be the first feeling that must emerge from the will element of music that the human being feels. Let me read that again. This feeling will take shape only very primitively, of course, but it will be the first feeling that must emerge from the will element of music that the human being feels an integral part of the cosmos. The end of lecture three.